This is the back end of a Browning 725. Oh, oh my God, how did that happen? Well, let's quickly talk about how to repair this, why it happened, and in the future, how to minimize the opportunity that it's gonna happen again. Hoorah. This particular piece of equipment got damaged when the gun was dropped on the butt. And as you can see in this picture, um, they bent a piece of 5,000 series aluminum. Okay, that'll happen. Note that the crack is below the axis of the screw. So this isn't one of those deals where they ran the screw in and popped it like it was a wedge. What we see here and the way that the, the professional gun fitter explained this to me, um, this lady has some neck issues, so they have her head stood up a long way up. So this butt has been dropped down to bring the, the back end of the gun up enough so she can shoot in an erect posture. Well, I don't have any numbers on this, so what I'm going to do, Sharpie marker can be taken off with, the, with brake cleaner. So we're just going to Sharpie over the top of this and then very lightly scribe a line in here. So I'm just going to take a sharp, um, metal poker and I'm just going to scribe a light liner on the top so that when we take all this apart we'll be able to see where to put it back again but in a way that if, if cosmetics are really that important we can just buff all this out but this is just my way of not hosing over the last guy to fit this gun um, I don't think that this was a structural failure but we'll talk about that in a little bit first thing we're going to do is fix it discuss the modes in which it could possibly fail, and then we'll do a few things, um, talk about how we kept it from happening or minimize the chance of happening again. I took the recoil pad off. It's a couple of machine screws. They're uh, hex, not hex, listen to me. They're just regular Phillips heads inside there. And when you take a pad off, this hole's through here on purpose. I don't know what they're doing with it. But the more often you take a pad on and off and you don't lubricate, the screwdriver head it'll begin to rip the rubber up so that's why every now and then you'll just see me either lick this or put a little bit of sex wax on it we got an entire tray full of that right there to just lubricate that a little bit now we will attempt to find an allen wrench that fits there we go so this is the one that i would ordinarily have expected to cause this blowout because of a wedging action but in this particular case i don't think so I don't know of a piece of wood that might have been able to take this clotzing. Okay. So as we saw from the still photograph, this thing got hit pretty hard right there. But they've got an insert in it. This whole setup was done correctly. I'm not, I'm not uptight about that. Yep, one more size up. Man, gravity sucks. There we go, right there. Okay, so that goes in. Yeah, that bad boy's on there pretty tight. Okay. I'm just trying to be gentle with this. Now, there's a slide that moves up and down inside of this, and we don't want to lose that. So what we'll do, we'll take this off, and we'll just run this screw back up inside that slide right there to keep all that captured. There's probably a 100 different ways to do this this setup and and i don't i don't need to find out how they all work you just deal with the machine that's laying in front of you but as you can see here and we'll show it to you in another view you can see where that lightly scribed line went to tell me where to go ahead and put it back together again okay so this will come out and reveal some interesting things all right there are inserts there's an insert in here, an insert in here, and the crack goes right through the center of the insert. So, very brash wood, and it blew right up. It blew, look at that, you can see that. It came right up that grain line, right across the end grain, and right over the top. Okay. Well, while we've got this camera angle on, let me see here if I can find the right key to take this out. Is this it? Yeah, this is it. Okay, as we pull this out, you'll see that crack collapse. Okay, this is the right way to do it. It's the right way to do it. 
A normal screw has got tapered threads. So as you run it in, it's a wedge. This is a barrel, just a straight up and down, and it's interrupted. So this thing acts like a tap and just, you drill the minor diameter and then this will screw itself into the wood because all we're doing is holding this recoil appliance on the back end of the gun. We're not pulling torque. We're not carrying any recoil. This is not a really um, dynamic setup back here, but it is when the grain, when the grain direction on a piece of wood is yes, you've got that problem. I've moved the action back into the pad so that the action's being held by the universal work holding system. Um, and we're gonna take the stock off of the action, not the action out of the stock. There are two scenarios here when you're undoing one of these, one of which you either drop the action on the concrete floor, and I don't care how big or thick your rubber mat is, the action will find terra firma. It's a potential energy thing. Nukes get it. Um, or the worst case scenario is you drop the wood on the ground and stuff blows up. Um, in this particular case, the wood's right here. Now, why am I taking the stock off of the action? two things going on here. I don't want to deal with all of this mass up here. So when I'm working on a stock, I don't want all this weight. Again, refer back to dropping it. But the second thing is, by doing that, we now have an opportunity to take make a cursory inspection of the action. I don't expect to find anything. This gun is too new, but th th what I can do is reset the clock on the last time a gunsmith looked at it. So we offer that, and beginning gunsmiths, there is a difference between doing maintenance, which is what we're doing right now, and service. Service means taking care of the customer. Maintenance means taking care of the equipment. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're gonna pull that rod all the way out and set that down. We're gonna make sure here now that we don't have a trigger guard screw. We have no trigger guard screw, so we're gonna reset the focus here and you see the, the hand grip? Instead of beating on this thing or prying on it and wedging on it, we're gonna use the mass of the action against itself. Right there. And that's it, we didn't have to pry, we didn't have to wedge. No crying, no gnashing of teeth. And as predicted, the inside of this thing is gorgeous. However, we're here to work on the stock. We'll get to this in a little bit. We've realigned the camera again here and I'll go ahead and bring the light over so you can see what I'm talking about. And you see where the crack went right through the center of the hole. This is called a stress riser. And we haven't broken this wood all the way through yet. And what I'm trying to do is see if I can pry it up just a little bit. You see how it's moving? This is an incredibly brash piece of wood, but we're gonna repair this thing in two steps. We're gonna open this up a little bit and we're gonna smash as much glue down in here as we can uh, smash down in it. This particular gun happens to have an oil finish on it, which is, awesome it's not one of those sprayed on plastic finishes sprayed on plastic finishes are nearly impossible to blend this if i do it right we might be able if we're very judicious about not smearing a lot of glue along the outside of this we might actually uh, stand a fighting chance of this disappearing is what we're going to hope for that'll be step one and we'll clamp it from down here to here and we'll step on this and clamp it shut while the glue is setting up. Then, I don't know if I want to do this with individual dog bones across the crack, or if I want to just take a U-shaped uh, piece of threaded rod all the way around like this and inlet it down in to give us some shear strength across this green so that this doesn't happen again. Um, and then the last thing we're gonna have to do is this end grain actually got shoved that way a little bit. There's some damage right there, and that'll result in a very unsightly looking line that I don't wanna have there. So um, we'll probably kiss this on a sander, and I mean just kiss it to get the whole thing flat again, and then we're gonna have to bend this back, and I'm gonna tell you what, let me get that light right. Yeah, you can see it, the top of it is bent we showed that before in a still, but it's even worse when you're looking at it in person. Um, there's some, you can see the damage up here. We'll try to clean this up, but there's not enough material to uh, go back and shove it all in. We'll try to do that. So this is a multi-step repair process. And when we're all done, you shouldn't know we were in here. And that is the operative idea.
The time to figure out how you're going to jig your clamping setup is before you get the glue on this. All right, we're not just going to glue this. You can't just glue grain. Look at this. This piece of wood is stunning. I've got this wooden piece here so that we're not putting pressure right on that sharp point of the toe. We're spreading it out a little bit. And now I know that I've got this clamp set right. So what we can do here is unwind this and let that crack pop open a little bit. And then we'll just take any old chisel, but in this particular case, let me get this light right here so I can reach around it. You guys all right with this light right here? That's fine, okay. So I'm gonna take this chisel and I'm just gonna come right up the edge of this hole here. And I'm just gonna lightly tap this Now, how far you bend this just depends upon how much copper is in the brass in your nuts. It's totally up to you, but I've got this open a little bit further than I'm comfortable with. However, I hope that this is a family-friendly channel, so I have to stop from there. All right, so I've got some black acroglass mixed up, and any of those that have been around when I've acroglass stuff before, know that acroglass is black because the grain here is black. If we put brown in this, why is there this brown wad of crap sticking out of this? You're right, don't do that brown. We're gonna do it black, okay? And what we're gonna try to do here is keep this acroglass off of this finish because the least amount of finish we have to repair, the better a chance we have at hiding this, okay? This is going to get much messier before we are done here. Okay, so I'm just down in and I'm trying to get it wet down in. Now, he just said he was going to keep it off the finish. I did, and yet I'm going to come in from the outside and then we're going to wipe it down and it'll be all right. But I want to make sure I keep all this surface stuff wet. Okay. Now, I'm going to come over here on this side where you can't see it. And I'm going to come back up in here and I'm going to walk into this crack from the outside. Okay. Now we'll come back and we'll switch over. We'll switch this wedge over so we can get glue in there. But the biggest way we're going to force um, glue into this crack is we're going to fill this center hole up. And yes, we're going to have to re-tap it when we're done. But I intend to fill this center hole up and tap a dowel down into it and blow it out. So that's kind of what I want to do. I don't want to glue this little gizzy down in that hole if I can get away with it. Because if we have a negative outcome, if we follow these threads, if there's any one of a number of things that would happen, then we're going to have to really turn on some of that gunsmithing gas. All right, so here we go. We're gonna fill that hole up. And this is gonna horrify some people, but you just gotta trust me, cause I am gunsmith, da. Ah. So we put a lot of glue in there. And remember that this wedge doesn't sit in there very deep. We've got about 25 minutes of open time on this. So what I'm doing now is I'm gonna find a drill bit that's about that big around, okay? And we're just gonna tap that drill bit down in there. And like I said, this is gonna make an absolute freaking mess. But by doing that, I'm actually forcing this glue, I'm forcing this glue into that crack from the inside out. Now there's a hell of a vacuum and it gets drawn here. And this is a horrible mess, but here comes the magic, okay? We'll pop this out like that and let that start to settle in and then as that begins to settle in okay as that begins to settle in now is when we come back and we wipe all this excess off the outside we wipe it off the outside so we'll take all this off now ordinarily I would tell you to leave this laying on the surface but in this case we've wetted the surface and because we've wetted the surface, we're going to need to get this all the way off. And we'll get it off here in a minute. So let me go jettison this towel. I'll be right back. I'm going to wipe this off. Now, acroglass can be dissolved. It can be wiped off with acetic acid known as common vinegar. 
I don't want to do that because I don't want to kill the action of the glass. So I want to wipe this off and wipe it off with extreme prejudice. You're trying to keep it off your fingers because you don't want to roll. This is like an inking machine in a Gutenberg printing press. You don't want to roll a copy of your fingerprints onto this lady's stock. We're trying to not do that. So it'll come back up, it'll come off. I don't care what's on the end. What I care is what's on the finished part of the gun. And I'm gonna roll this over here so I can see what I'm doing on this side. Okay, now when we step down on this, it's gonna squeeze out. That's what we leave alone. And I'll show you here what that looks like. Okay, a little bit more in that crack right there. Just a little bit more right there where we had to wedge, but it wasn't much, all right? We'll do that. And then before our clamp is in the way, we'll just come in and screed this right off the top before the clamp's in the way. Okay, there we go. What an absolute mess. Okay. Now, this piece of wood went, oh, look at that. There's a staple in here. Now, what would have happened if I would have stepped on that scrap piece of wood? I don't know. Well, let's just get that out of the way. That actually went in the garbage can, so you don't know how much karma I just burned up. Okay. Bring that up here. Now, I did polish the insides of these, just like I polished the hammer faces, because I don't want to transfer, you know, years of welding marks to the inside of this. Roll that up. Set this down on there like that. And then, as we step on this, this doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be incredibly tight. You can probably see right there. Oops. There you go. Thank you. It doesn't have to be incredibly tight, but we're just driving that little bit of squeeze out right there. Hold on a minute. We're off. A little bit. I'm not coax. There we go. So on the other side of this, there's a very thin black line. You can see the squeeze out on the top. And you can see the squeeze out down the long grain barrier. And we're going to leave that alone. Because when we get all done, we should be able to just tink, just hit that with a, with a very sharp chisel. And that should drive that off. Then a little bit of buffing. And it might have got away with not hosing up the outside of the finish. And we're right back to one of the best ways to not screw one of these things up is to not screw it up in the first place. And the last thing we can do, getting most of this out of this hole will make our lives a lot simpler a little bit later on. So we're just going to pull this excess glass out of this hole. Beginning gunsmiths. Now you've mixed this acro glass up and you've got a lot of extra. Have something else figured out for all of this extra. What are you going to do with it? Well, in our particular case, we had this little chip here that was missing off the back end of this. There's a little itty bitty chip missing off the back end of this. So we're just gonna put a little, where'd it go? Right there, just a little dollop of glass right there so that I can sharpen that tip up later. Some of you guys might remember this rusted pile, I think, from my April Fool's joke. <laughs> yeah, this lady's uh, gun has not been allowed to be stored in a salt marsh for six months or some people said six years but we'll go from there all right let's take a little tour of the inside of this thing shall we we have a hammer and a mainspring driving it all right so this is the heart of the entire system now we're going to come down a little bit we're going to look at the sear this piece right here is the sear right there so that's what's holding us cocked now in the back of this whole thing there is a mechanism here that's going to allow us to lift up. Now, right now we can't do any of that because the safety's on, because the, the, the lever is all the way over. And this is an out of battery interlock that doesn't prevent, that does not allow you to pull the triggers while you're shutting the gun. All right, so if we move that out of the way, and that's all done with the barrels, right? We move that out of the way, we can close. And you can see how it's pushing this sear uh, actuating mechanism, it pushes it off. All right, so when that's up like that, and we're selected to trip this sear first. So, this is an inertial block, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to capture the weight on this spring. 
We're going to turn the safety off. Select the right hand barrel. Let me get my hand out of the way here. When you lift up on this, you see how it picks the sear up? Bang, the hammer drops. Now, while I've got my finger back on the trigger, if we did not have an inertial reset, my finger could come off of this trigger and come right back on and fire the other barrel. The way this is set up is that this thing will come aft, run into my shoulder, and in this inertial trip right here, let me get this right, right here, this inertial trigger will lift and cause that to reset. So now that that has lifted under inertia and reset, it now has the other sear lined up and it'll let that hammer drop also. Difficult to show you both sides of it. Without an inertial block, your finger comes in, the gun recoils to the rear, which means my hand appears to move forward, but I'm still commanding release and the gun will double, pop, pop. You'll see that on some of these Turkish doubles that are floating around, they'll do it and I can make them double on, on demand, all right? There's some other things that have happened here when this, when this came forward, all right? This sear drops down. So ordinarily when it's cocked, this sear is up here. When it drops, it gets out of the way and allows this vertical bar to, wait a minute, let me get it right. There's that vertical bar right there and allows that vertical bar to slide over to the other side pick up the other sear and drop the other barrel. Some other things occur when that happens. This particular rod right here is riding over a projection on the hammer. When that does that, that causes this projection right here on my thumb, right here, to stick out. And when that sticks out, that tells the um, shell ejector to trip when you open the barrels. If the gun is cocked and I got to clamp it back in here in order to cock it. If this barrel is cocked right here, you will see that that projection should not be sticking out and it wouldn't be if the barrel had been there to wipe it over. So we'll go ahead and punch this down. That will be sticking in and that will be sticking out because this side is not cocked and this side is. So if you only shoot the gun once and you drop the gun open, one side will lift the shells and the other side will spit them. So this is what this looks like when it's done right. And then the last thing is there's a mechanism up inside that when you open the gun, it will push the safety back. Now this is a competition gun, so it does not turn the safety off when you open up the bar. But most guns are set up so that when you pull this back, there's nothing telling commanding sear release inside the gun so that you don't shut the gun and have it go off. This is pretty sophisticated. I'll, I will admit to you that I've never been inside of a, a Browning 725 before, ever. This is my first look at it. It's immaculate. The manufacturing on it is flawless. All right, last thing, that's where the stock bolt goes in right there. So if you do a little bit of work on a gun and you have this stock bolt in so far, and I've seen this, you can actually turn this nut in so far that it will come through this block, stick out in here, and interfere with the trigger. You got to watch out for that, too. Anyway, inside of a 725, I intend to do nothing in here except wish this thing a happy life and walk away. It's been a week. We had to back away from this. Bruno was in some pretty high tension uh, editing configuration here, and I had a couple other things I had to do. So we're back to this. This has had plenty of time to get nice and hard. And you can see here where our crack boundary was right there. And we have the squeeze out over here, but the squeeze out has not, there right there, you see that? The squeeze out is laying on the surface and that's where I want it. We're gonna come here in a little bit and knock it off. But this is where I wanna talk about the inevitable, since a lot of you guys watching this haven't watched them for a long time, the inevitable discussion about all these atomic glues that people have. Well, my glue is better and it'll hold this joint. Yeah, this joint will hold great. And then the break is gonna slide over to right there. And the next time this thing breaks, it's gonna break right here. We have to reinforce this joint. We don't have a choice. We're gonna sand this down smooth and inlet two brass screws right across this. We're gonna put a dog bone in here and tie all this end grain together and do this in a way that we don't blow this toe line out or the heel line, I'm sorry, but we don't wanna blow this 
sharp edge out. When we're all done, we'd like to be able to get out of this and not have anybody know that we were here. So we're going to reset this camera angle here because I really want to show you what it's going to take to knock this out. But you'll notice in the swiveling universal work holding system, I've got the work up here and the end of my nose is like right there. So I'm, it's up where I can get to it and where I can see it and it can hang down under the bench. We've got towels wrapped around the stock. Treat this thing like it's a carton of eggs. Because this is just laid on the surface, we can very, very gently come in and cleave this off and it should snap right off at the boundary because this boundary has a, it comes up and it kind of rolls over like this and back down to the bottom and we're putting the chisel right on the bottom there and snapping it off. So we'll go to the strop here and we'll go ahead and strop this. You see that piece of leather in the background and I'm just making sure that I got the edge on this thing. Awful sharp. We should do, oh, we have done a video on that. All right. Okay. And I'm just milking this off very gently. And what I'm trying to do is not take the finish off with it. Sometimes we can get lucky here. And we might be able to steel wool this all down. But I'm being really, really, really gentle with an extremely sharp chisel. You can, I'm going to pull the light back a little bit here to get out of the way. You can turn the chisel on its on its side like this and very lightly scrape this. We're going to have a little white path there and we're going to color that with some Sharpie, blend it all in with a piece of steel wool. Okay, so right now this is flat. Now when really curly wood like this lets go, it explodes. It just, it unwinds. So we're in that boat. So this is a little bit of 4 aught steel wool. And I'm just going to do my damnedest here to blend it. Now when it exploded we had a little bit of overhang here. There's nothing you can do about it. What we're trying to do now is feather feather the damage. Okay. Just feathering it. And then I'm going to show you a little trick here. Okay. Grain is black. All right. So we're not using any browns here. We're not doing anything. And I told the lady that owned this gun, I was going to do my best to hide this with that, without taking the finish all the way off the stock and being able to sand this. We weren't going to be able to get that lucky. Sharpie marker makes a fabulous black stain. Okay, that looks kind of schmutzy, but when we get when that Sharpie sits and we get in here and we get a chance to take this off and we put a little bit of oil on this, it's going to look pretty good considering what it could have looked like otherwise. So over the duration of this repair, we're going to oil this, wipe it off, let it oxidize, oil it, wipe it off, let it oxidize. We're going to get about three, maybe five coats of oil on this, five applications of oil, let it all uh, oxidize off hard, and then take a little bit of thousand grit sandpaper and mud it just a little bit, and it should disappear. When you're applying oil, oil, it's not a coat. This is not urethane. You're just putting on 
an application. And we'll let that get hard. Now, there is some definition to this. You can still see where the crack was because the wood got damaged. Now, we'll fill that in with a little bit of finish. But when it's all done, you can also see down here, you can see the grain in this thing. And when it's all done, we just want to hide it and just make it look like a bark inclusion or something. And when we're done, it'll be gone. All right. So I'm going to do the other side of the stock. And then the next time you see us, we'll be back up on our rear end and we're going to get going up there. You can see we have a lot of cutting going on up here and not a lot down here so there's an assumption made that this cut was made flat in the first place and i'm going to run with that but i'm also assuming that when this stock got hit this entire thing got shoved a little bit um wood's just a bundle of soda straws and you, you gotta kind of attack it like that now there's a couple of things here i'm just laying that on and pushing that i've almost got this hump out of it i'm just very lightly knocking this hump off the hump right here now all this extra sawdust that extra sawdust gets rubbed into whatever anomalies we had over here and the oil is sucking that right up and allowing the um we can blend it with its own with its own sawdust there's some when this went it took some of the finish with it but I'm gonna make sure I've got this cut, and it is. We don't want to knock the knock off the sides here. Now this ferrule cuts its own threads, and we have filled this hole up full of acro glass. So we look at the minor diameter of this, the inside. We get a drill bit that's just slightly under it, and we go in and carefully, and I mean carefully milk that excess acro glass out now we do not want to do is drive this drill down into that end right there and have this nasty hole sticking out so you got to go nice and easy so that you don't suck the drill through the hole and it'll just grab and whoosh, right through okay Now this should start to cut its own threads if we did this right. This doesn't have a taper on it and the screw that goes in it doesn't have a taper on it whereas a normal wood screw has a taper and a normal wood screw would wedge this apart and blow it up. So we don't want to do that. And now we're going to come in and do the screw slots. So I've got a this is called a woodruff cutter and we're going to use this woodruff cutter and we're going to cut the two channels for the screws this way. I've got the stock flipped over because if we run out of the end of this channel I want the cutter to go that way not come over the top mess up this top edge mess this up. And we're even going to hedge our bets further because we're going to tape the bejeebers out of everything that doesn't look like what we're getting ready to do. Okay. I'm just going to put this along the edge here. And guard us. Now you say, well, it won't stick because he's got oil down there. Eh, maybe it won't. I don't care. All I'm trying to do is guard, guard this edge. All right. We want to avoid close proximity to the edges. This is awful shiny. There we go. That's a little better. We want to avoid close proximity to the edges. So I've got one of these little Dremel. Um, this thing was designed to 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 uh, do manicures on dogs. So for 19 bucks, it's nice and cheap, and it allows me to just.
and I have a lot of control because I don't have a tremendous amount of torque here. Okay. These look a little wobbly, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we're going to drop a screw in there and then cover it all over with acro glass, and we'll make it look pretty. Now, I am going the wrong way over here. I understand this. But I have my hand guarding it. Okay. When I began this, I was going to use brass. But I wanted to use a slightly smaller diameter, so I shifted over to these. I know I talked about brass, but... Okay, you're not going to see this. It's going to be underneath the plate, so there's no reason that to uh, get the stain out. That stain is some really nasty, heinous stuff. Okay. I want to make sure we get the wood wet. This stuff will actually change the color of the wood you can see the chemicals starting to soak in now I'm going to switch over to a more pointed application instrument I just want to make sure we get the glue all the way up inside the crack and then we'll butter the screws I'll throw the screws in so what we're doing here is just tying all of this end grain together to make it more difficult to break this in the future. And I'm choosing my words very carefully. So I'll just roll this in the epoxy here like this. And yeah, it's gonna be a disaster, but just kind of like when you're doing chicken, you got a wet hand and a dry hand. In my particular case, I now have two wet hands. Okay, let's pick that up. Butter this. You'll notice I've got a towel wrapped around this stock down here. You, and I'm just, you got to be very, very careful where you're putting your fingers. Okay. Because the bottom of the crack has been thoroughly buttered, we can now come back up over the top. And just make sure that we have contact all the way around. And we'll come back in with some sandpaper later. File all this off smooth. Don't get any down inside that machine screw hole. That's probably not a good place to have it. But you can have extra stacked up on top. When this is done, you'll be able to see the screws. But I think uh, I'm probably the only man that's going to see it because... Either me or the gentleman that's that's setting the uh, setting this gun up for this lady. Other than that, make sure that's down in there, all the way to the bottom. Down, good. Now the threads on this mechanically bind everything together. So now you have a mechanical bond and a chemical bond between the glue and the thread. And that's going to result in a very strong thing. I've done this before. We've done. Um, Bruno's Argentine Mauser, we, re we repaired that. We did the same thing. It's all the same thing. But if, once you understand the mechanics involved here, so now we can just take this off. Look at that. We don't have anything on the side of the stock. Oh, it's
I've got some masking tape on this in order to protect protect it from the jaws. Aluminum doesn't respond well to just being sat on like this. If you come in like this, it'll flex. You can see it flexing, but it's coming right back. We're going to have to hit this, which is why I had it mounted up. Now, I showed you that because Bruno asked me that question, and it's a legitimate freaking question. Now, when it is bent, it bent right through the center of this hole because this is where the least amount of material is. Um, and it's going to bend through that hole every time. We could come in with, say, a. Um, we can come in with an Allen wrench before we beat on this. And all we're going to do is just massage it over. But you've got to go a long way to get aluminum to bend. And if I lean into this, we will snap this part off. Sure is the day is long. So as with other things that I'm doing in vices, there's a lot of feel to this. I'm feeling how far it's going, how far it's coming back. And to be really honest, I don't think I moved it at all. Yeah, I moved it a little bit. It's bent pretty good up here at the top. So we'll come up a little bit. We're just we're just pushing it around and bumping it. You don't have to really kill it, but there is still a very distinct reverse curl to this. Um, we want to be careful about that. All right, polished hammer. We had some material here that was sticking out, and we're just going to push that metal back. Okay, we push that back. A little bit of a lump there. What I can see that you can't see is I'm bouncing this light off of it and I'm working in the shadows. We're there. However, this we've got the body curl out of it already just from that little bit of a bump. But now we're going to have to put a little bit more zip into this. So let me tape this. Beginning gunsmith, sometimes it really feels like you're in a pie eating contest and the prize for having eaten the most pie is more pie and and it just sometimes you just wonder where the heck the end of this is yeah there you go now we got it again polished hammer faces you don't want to be marking everything up. And that was what it took to move this back. Now it doesn't, it doesn't look like I moved much, but I am going to tell you that I was not polite about how hard I was cracking on this pig. I'm hitting it because I want it to move. And that's us right there. We didn't have to hit it very hard. We'll take it out, check it on a flat plate, make sure we got it flat, but where it doesn't, again, like with stones or with hammers, um, learning how hard to hit it is a judgment call based on how many times you've screwed it up. And I will guarantee you, I have screwed this up more times than most of you have ever even tried to do it, but that's actually flat. So let's put it back on the gun, shall we? See, that's flat all the way across now. It's flat as it's going to get because and you'll notice that I was hitting it with a hammer here and hitting the hammer because if you hit it here all this is going to bend and then this thing can just turn into a it looked like a harbor when it's mad and then we'll come back in now with a little bit of thousand grit paper here and I'm just going to kind of just polish it back up again a little bit we'll get all the way down through the grits um, and just make it look less heinous. Now we've taken off that Sharpie line, but that very, very, very slight line that was engraved in that we can still see so that we stand a snowball's chance of putting this thing back together again, kind of like how it was uh, when it got mailed to us. I'm under the opinion, not the opinion,
There, that's some 800 grit now, and you can see the very faint line here that I had engraved, and we, we basically sanded away. Um, I'm under the impression that this gun's going to be fit again, so we're going to want to kind of get close, knowing fully well that whatever numbers I put on this are going to be taken right back off. Um, so we're just trying to make it look pretty. It did get beat up. You can see here where I tapped that metal back up on top. We'll just kind of spiff it up here. I really detest polishing metal. I don't like polishing metal. I object, but okay, that looks a lot better. So now we'll roll the device back up, bring the stock back over here because it's had a couple hours to set up, and uh, we'll take the remainder of the acro glass off the top and reassemble this pig. <laughs> These Shinto rasps are the absolute bee's knees for this. We're not trying to remove any wood, we're just trying to take this glass down until it's flush. We don't want any above flush surfaces here because then as we pull down with the plate, this way, no, wrong plate, oh, let's get the one we just fixed. As we suck this plate down, we don't want to introduce any stresses in here. So we want everything to fit flat. There shouldn't be a whole lot of torque on anything back here. All we're trying to do is hold this in position because the force goes through it this way, not that way. Now this is set up for a little while and it's hard, but it's not hard. Um, it's still a little bit soft. You can see the bottom of the screw starting to pop up here. We're going to transition over to a regular metal file here in a minute. And you can hear it starting to touch down there. Now a lot of this, especially if you're the owner of this thing, it's a lot like watching sausage being made. If you really like sausage, you probably shouldn't watch it being made. could argue that we could take this thing up and kiss it on a sander problem is I don't have the jig and for me to get the not the jig I own plenty of jigs but to get this set up in a jig and get all the angles right and kiss it I'm gonna be done in three or four minutes all right so yeah there are a lot more technically correct ways to do it but this will get us exactly the same finish line with a lot less grief and we can move on to the next job and this lady can have her gun back. There we go. Extremely careful. Don't roll. Don't roll it off the end here. You see how we're starting to touch down? Don't roll it. You want to keep it flat. Absolutely flat. We're flat all the way across. So then we've got to mount the action because this plate will trap the action screw. So we need to mount the action to the gun. So we'll, we'll flip this thing over and we'll attack it down this axis. That will mount on there. We're smooth. And it doesn't look like it was done by a trained rat. I did lubricate this while we had it apart. Never, don't take the action out and not, you know, hit it with a couple of key areas of just a little bit of lubricant there. We'll reinsert. 
run this up. In this particular case, an 11 millimeter socket. Yeah, you want it tight, but don't put a torque wrench on this thing. Just bring it up till it stops and then bump it, and that's tight enough. You don't want it to work loose, but you don't want it so tight that you're damaging the wood up in the head end of the stock. Okay. I pre-assembled this just so we're not trying to fight this little tab while we're inside the stock. Come in here. And obviously, when you're putting things together like this, never torque it all the way down. What we don't know is whether or not that hole is deep enough to take this screw. We, we had fouled the bottom of it with acroglass, and I was careful to not run the drill bit all the way in there. It looks like we're going to be in good, good shape here. You don't have to kill this. Just bring it down till it's till it's soft lands. There you go. That's now mounted on the back end of the gun. And now this can be brought. We had these lines that were etched in it. I, I can barely see them, so I know you can't. Right about there. Based on the lines that I've seen on the gun previously. This has like a sandpaper surface on the back, so you don't have to kill this. It's just got to be tight enough to hold its adjustments. So you hear a theme here, okay? You know, give, give, the, give the thing a break. Back in the beginning, we were talking about putting a little bit of sex wax on the um, screwdriver shaft. For those of you that aren't acquainted with it, that's essentially a little bit of Mr. Zog's surfboard wax, and they call it sex wax. And that's what I use it for, so that's what I've got it in there for. But what that little bit of wax does is keeps you from roughing up the pad here. See, and it just goes in and turns nice, bump. Come on up, center the pad, and bump. If these screws are too long, they will begin to jack this plate off of this one. And the, there's not a lot of room in here, but at the end of the day, a couple of more uh, applications of oil and rubbing this thing out, we got out of the brake. Now, you know where the brake is there. You can see it. And that'll all happen. We're not going to hold this gun long enough to actually film me doing it. But it's just a matter of oils and a little bit of um, 4 aught steel wool and then some 1,000 grit paper. We'll rub it all down. And when you get more than 3 or 4 feet away from it, you're not going to know that this incident happened. It's structurally sound. And as always, it's been a pleasure.